Hello, it's Martin from Wisely Automotive and like Tesla or not, you have to admit they've set the benchmark in the mass market EV sector with the Model 3 and later the Model Y. But what if you don't like Tesla for whatever reason? Well, in this video we will discuss why the Polestar 2 is the next best thing, at least in our opinion, as an EV specialist. It's no coincidence that the Polestar 2 often gets compared to the Tesla Model 3 because in terms of footprint they are very similarly sized vehicles. However, the Polestar 2 being built on the XC40 platform by Volvo, it is a little bit higher up and you have got a bit more ground clearance at the bottom. However, having said that, it definitely has less interior space than something like the Model Y. So if you're after outright interior volume, something like the Model Y or its alternatives like the Nissan Aria, which we have done a review of, I will leave that link in the top right hand corner, will be probably better options. But this is a very nice balance of compact car on the outside, quite snug in the cockpit, but still spacious enough for a family. Plus, as I mentioned, despite it being built on an ICE platform, which is shared with the Volvo XC40, excuse all of this mess, I just picked the vehicle up. If I pop this open, you will see that it still has a front, despite this being the front wheel drive model. So Volvo slash Polestar have definitely taken the care to maximize the space available because there is a front motor underneath there somewhere. At least you have got enough space to store your tire repair kit, your locking wheel nut, and if you need to, the cables out of the way so you have got more space in the boot. Speaking of the boot, at least in my eyes, that's the biggest differentiating factor compared to the Model 3. First of all, you can just wave your foot underneath the rear bumper and the boot lid will automatically pop open. Again, this is not available on all Polestar 2s from the factory, so make sure to check out the video we have done about that in the top right hand corner. And as you can see, it is a hatchback, so you've got a much bigger opening than the saloon style opening of the Model 3. And even though it is not a bespoke EV platform, there's plenty of space here. These plus pack cars have this handy divider in the boot so you can section that out and you've got additional hooks to keep your groceries from flying all over the place. And if I lift the floor, you see there's plenty of space still if you want to keep the cables in the back instead of under the bonnet. In terms of practicality, this massive opening is really hard to beat and obviously you can take the partial shelf out as well if you want to, for example, carry dogs or a massive mountain bike, anything like that, in the boot. If you are into skiing instead, you can also pop open the middle section for a ski load through, otherwise the seats do fold in a 60-40 split and they do lie completely flat. If you want to carry even more stuff, you have got the possibility of an optional tow hitch right from the factory or alternatively every Polestar 2 is compatible with roof racks as well. If you're wondering about rear seat space, let me squeeze myself in because this is where it gets a little bit complicated. At the end of the day, how comfortable you are and how much space you have will depend on your build and how tall you are. I myself am exactly six foot or 182 centimeters. And even if I sit up straight, I just about have enough headroom. However, if you're going to be carrying people in the back regularly, we would definitely recommend to go for a Polestar 2 equipped with the plus package, which includes this fantastic panoramic glass roof, because not only does it look cool, it extends all the way back above the rear passenger's heads. So that increases headroom by a tiny bit. And most importantly, otherwise the default color and the only color for the headlining is black so it can get quite dark in the back of the cabin especially with these quite narrow windows so having the glass roof definitely makes the cabin feel a bit more spacious in terms of legroom the front seat is set to my usual driving position and as you can see i've got plenty of knee room and in fact because of the more upright architecture of the polestar 2 i can even slide my feet underneath the seat in front so there's definitely enough space here as you can see there is a so-called transmission tunnel here obviously this car is full electric so there is no transmission or a drive shaft going into the back it's just the way the batteries are packaged yeah obviously the drawback is that you have got a middle tunnel so the person sitting in the middle will not be the most comfortable but the plus side is that you've got these very deep footwells so as i said you've got the benefit of being able to stretch out a little bit more if you need to carry kids you obviously have isofix points on the outer rear seats but also an anchor and the additional points on the front passenger seat enough of the practicality stuff let's actually focus on the fun stuff which is the cockpit because just like a tesla this is a proper ev in a sense that you do not have a start stop button the moment you jump in the screens come to life the hvac is running and i can just put my foot on the brake flick the gear selector into drive 
and off I go. Before I set off, let me show you the infotainment system because this is where a lot of the other brands kind of fall flat. But Polestar has done the right thing and partnered with Google. And obviously Google being a tech company, they know how to do all of this kind of stuff. So for example, even if I go into the maps, I've got obviously Google Maps built in. The system is nice and responsive. I can recenter. If I go into the home screen, there is still a lot of dedicated EV stuff, but it's all nicely laid out. It doesn't feel like information overload. It was definitely designed with an EV in mind rather than an adaptation of an existing user interface. Speaking of which, all of the buttons are quite nice and big, easy to use, easy to tap even while driving. But the nice thing about this system is that it's very customizable and once you set it up to your liking, you can save it to your user profile and you will basically never have to touch it again while driving. Plus you've got the fantastic Google voice command system. So let me try to demonstrate it in one take. Okay, Google, navigate to Wisely Automotive. Navigating to Wisely Automotive. I mean, that's how it should work. Wisely Automotive may be closed by the time you arrive. I mean, that's how it should work in 2024. It even shows me real-time traffic information, speed, cameras, and exactly how much battery I will have left at arrival. But it's not all just technology for the sake of technology. For example, you still have a traditional instrument cluster. Yes, it's a screen, but at least you can see what speed you're doing right in front of you without having to look at the middle display. Personally, I don't find it that big of a deal, but I know some people really want to have a screen in front of them. Speaking of which, the biggest positive in my eyes is the fact that it serves as extra real estate. Because if I press this button, I can bring the Google Maps view over in the instrument cluster, which means that my passenger can, for example, be in charge of the music and using the screen or I can have the range information there but I still know where I'm going. Also refreshingly I still have some physical buttons on the steering wheel and behind the steering wheel on the stalks a traditional rain sensor for the rain sensing wipers who would have thought that that's something which would need highlighting in this day and age with a very easy way of adjusting the sensitivity. Normal parking sensors, a proper 360 degree view camera, which yes, it can come with its own shortcomings, but it means you actually get a proper view out, including out at the front, rather than the car relying on, let's be honest, beta technology to guess how far away an obstacle is, etc, etc. But let me cancel the guidance for now, because I want to show you something else along the route as well. Firstly, I will also reset the trip computer so we can see how efficient the car is on this journey. Being quite young and having the plus pack, it also does have the heat pump fitted. But it's not all just about the specs, because as you can appreciate, there's a lot more to an EV than that. It's about how it feels to drive as well. And Polestar has really, really done this well in terms of the power delivery, for example. As you can see in the settings, you can enable full one pedal driving, and it means it's very simple to very smoothly come to a complete stop and you can't even feel the car stopping. You can be very precise with how you stop, which is very important in these EVs because you don't want to make your passengers sick. On the other hand of the spectrum, if you need to go, even the single motor version with front wheel drive will pick up the speed without any problems. And as you saw, even though I kind of floor the accelerator pedal there, there was no hesitation from the drivetrain. I got the response immediately. There was no tires squealing, nothing like that. It just deploy the power as well as it reasonably could. Again, it's one of the things which you can't quite put into a spec sheet, but it's nice to see that Polestar has paid attention to these details as well and delivered a very refined package. Speaking of refinement, as you can hear, it's fairly quiet in here. It's obviously not perfect. It's not a super high-end vehicle. It's still a mass market car at the end of the day. Unfortunately, 40, 50 grand these days is what's regarded as mass market, but it's definitely a little bit better than the Tesla. Mostly, I would say, because the Polestar features framed windows instead of frameless doors, which means that when you shut the door, there is a much better seal and you get much less wind whistle from around the A and B pillars. The suspension also seems to be tuned slightly on the softer side, at least compared to the pre-Highland Model 3s. And combined with the slightly heavier weight of the Polestar, it almost has a certain waft to it. But yeah, that's about it for now. What I will do, once I move over into this lane, I will just turn on the adaptive cruise control, which is radar based, nice and simple, like you would expect it to be and pilot assist on as well, which enables the lane centering. And that's it. I will just sit here, enjoy the journey, possibly listen to some of the Harman Kardon sound system, and I will catch up with you at the next stop.
I made a Tesla supercharger which is open to all EVs and this is a V3 so it has one of these short cables but luckily the Polestar 2 has the charge port in the same location as the Model 3 so it's super simple to plug this in using the correct stall so I'm not blocking two spaces yet I've got access to superchargers. This is what I mean by the EV basics being very good. I've got all the information I need as an EV driver, exact charging info in kilowatts. Obviously we are not achieving the peak power at the moment because the state of charge is quite high at 54%. I only really stopped to show you how the process works. Most importantly, the charging performance is very dependable and consistent. For example, if I put a destination far away into the Google Maps, like Edinburgh, you see how quick and responsive this is. This is how it should work. The car will automatically suggest charging stops. And just like a Tesla, it will tell you where you need to stop, how long for, and it will also preheat the battery so you will get the best possible charging sessions for the shortest possible travel time. It will show you exactly where it wants me to charge. Nice and simple, and it has actually done a good job. This is again an area where some other built-in systems struggle, where they will suggest for you to charge for seven hours on a slow AC charger. Not to mention you also get software updates, so you will see the car has already pre-downloaded one and will install it overnight. And this is not just for the head unit and the infotainment system, but they can go down to all the control units in the vehicle. If you want to learn more about what kind of improvements you can expect, we've made a dedicated video to the latest big software update Polestar pushed out. So again, we will leave the link in the top right hand corner. It started raining quite heavily on the way back, but despite that and the roads being quite glossy, the pilot assist handled the situation perfectly. I was basically locked in at the national speed limit on the cruise control. I've now made it through London and I'm in the office. So let's take a look at the efficiency figures. 27.5 kilowatt hours per 100 miles. Like usual, I will put the conversions at the bottom of the screen. But if you do the math with this being the long range version, even though not all of the 78 kilowatt hours of battery capacity are usable, you get well above 250 miles of real world range on a charge. To put that into context, the benchmark Tesla Model 3 tends to be about 0.5 miles per kilowatt hour more efficient across a combined use case but they also feature slightly smaller battery packs. So the real world range is very similar between the two vehicles. Unfortunately, in the Polestar, it does cost a little bit more to cover the same distance because of said lower efficiency. There is no way around it. That's the price you pay for the more aggressive, upright, blocky styling. And of course, also the fact that it's not built on a bespoke EV architecture, which makes it a bit heavier than the Model 3. I don't want to end up on a negative note, because regardless of whether you are considering the Tesla Model 3 as well or not, the Polestar 2 is simply a fantastic vehicle. To be fair, one of the reasons why you may have ended up on this video specifically is because Teslas are notoriously quite expensive to insure. And even though the Polestar 2 shares a lot of features with the Teslas and it's a similar vehicle, they seem to come out a lot cheaper on the annual and monthly figures. So it's definitely an option worth considering. It's further helped by the fact that with the Polestar 2, you do not have to commit to the all-wheel drive version if you want the big battery pack. And in fact, that's our best seller, the long-range battery with the single motor drivetrain that keeps the price low. The insurance company is also happy, yet you still get the fantastic range. And as you hopefully saw, perfectly reasonable efficiency. Look, we could be here for hours discussing which features are more important and make up the better overall package, but at the end of the day, that's down to you and what you value more. The important bit is that both of these brands have a fantastic foundation and they are doing all the core things very well. That means good batteries with reliable charging performance, good built-in route planners and infotainment systems. In case of the Polestar 2, if you don't like the built-in stuff, you can always use Apple CarPlay if you're an iPhone user. Good reliable technology, full over-the-air capability for updates, and the list just goes on. So yeah, now it's your turn. Let us know in the comments below which one you would prefer. If you want to see more EV content, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you want to learn more about the Tesla Model 3 side of things, make sure to check out that video and why we think the Model 3 is a fantastic vehicle. And yeah, as always, thank you very much for watching. See you in the next one.